For many, owning lakeside property is a dream come true. But living lakeside can sometimes put residents right in the path of disaster. Monday, June 17, 1946. In Windsor, Ontario, across the border from Detroit, hot and humid summers are common, but this day has been particularly muggy. It was very, very hot, and there wasn't any breeze. It was an eerie feeling. There weren't any birds uh, chirping, and it was very quiet and still, and, and it had this yellowy cast, and I can remember looking around wondering why it's so hot. A lot of the time with severe thunderstorms, people report seeing a green tin sky, and usually this means that there's hail present. In this case, people reported seeing a yellow tin sky. Seven-year-old Virginia Herrick lives with her mother, her grandparents, and two sisters just outside Windsor. Her father, Alexander, has been serving overseas, but the family looks forward to his return in just a few days. Her mother, Jean, loves gathering her girls around the piano in the living room. Uh, she liked to play the piano, and she liked to sing. She was in the choir at the church. Um, she was always making things for the house, like she would make curtains and, you know, covers for cushions, and she was very artistic that way. By the time Virginia and her family sit down for supper, the sky has darkened, and it is raining heavily. In central Windsor, Helen Sues finishes work at a downtown hat shop. Married just a week before, she walks the few blocks to the service station where husband Frank is employed. It was my first day back to work after getting married. It was raining and stormy. And while I was at the station waiting for him, it, there was great amounts of hail and the wind was so strong it blew the station door open. Helen's parents, Harry and Gladys Wowako, also live in Windsor's rural perimeter. A Russian immigrant, Harry is particularly proud of their small farm and the house they have built with their own hands. It was a white wood with blue trim. Mum had a great deal of pride in it because she had helped my dad and my brother, you know, they were built when they were building it. So for them, it meant a lot. On this particular afternoon, Gladys Wowako is looking after her only grandchild, Claudia. My sister was married and didn't live at home, so my mother was taking care of my niece. The storm came up, and so she had taken my niece by the hand, and they had gone from room to room to close the windows because it was raining so hard. Thunderstorms are common here in summer, so Gladys isn't concerned. But showers have been known to turn into something more. It's actually on the tail end of the U.S. tornado alley that runs up from Texas up to the northeast towards the Midwest. And uh, some of the storms that come up from the Midwest uh, end up hitting Windsor. The weather in June 1946 has been particularly active. Two small tornadoes touched down in the Windsor area on Sunday the 16th. Early on the 17th, a twister hits west of Detroit with one casualty. By late afternoon on June 17th, a powerful funnel cloud developed southwest of Detroit. There were 35 injuries, but miraculously no fatalities on the U.S. side of the river. Then it crossed the Detroit River and ended up in the Brighton Beach area just south of Windsor. Brighton Beach is home to Henry and Sadie Jones, who live on a farm with their seven children, including 12-year-old Carl. It was a big family. His mother was always cooking. Apparently, she was a happy-go-lucky lady. Uh, loved to cook, loved to have company, and feed everybody. Around 6 p.m. on June 17th, Carl Jones works in the garden with his father, Henry, and brother Kenny. On a neighboring farm, 12-year-old Leah is also outside when she spots something in the distance. I saw it above the houses, just the top part of it, and it was whirling around and dirt and wood and other stuff. 
I didn't know what it was, but it was scary. I went in the house and told my dad, and he came out and looked and said it was just a twister. It is not just a twister, but a raging F4 tornado with winds as high as 400 kilometers an hour. And it's headed straight for Brighton Beach and the city of Windsor. People really didn't know what to expect when they saw this funnel coming towards them. A lot of people uh, watched as it approached and unfortunately didn't get out of the path of the tornado as it as it came through. Nelson Jones, however, recognizes the danger immediately. Mr. Jones saw the tornado coming. He yelled for everybody to get into the house. It is a natural reaction, but unfortunately the Jones house is directly in the path of the tornado. One of the neighbors across the street said that uh, she saw the house go up into the tornado, followed by some of the Jones family themselves, which must have been a pretty harrowing experience. The tornado took the house. Uh, Carl and Kenny were taken up into the tornado and thrown out into a field. Carl and his family are swept into the churning funnel cloud and tossed in the air like rag dogs. His father, Nelson, lands in a nearby field. I suppose it happened all so fast that it, he didn't have a chance to think too much. And I imagine it, it knocked him out before he hit the ground. Panic, probably the, the worst. Wondering what was happening. The huge black funnel roars northward, swallowing everything in its path. Houses, barns, animals, and people. From her kitchen window, Jean Herrick sees it coming. My mother called us into the living room and she said, get down on your knees and pray. And why? She said, see that? It's a tornado. At that moment, the neighbors came over with all their children. There was about 12 of us. All the children that were our friends that came over, they were all screaming and, and crying, and everyone was very frightened because everyone thought they were going to die. And the tornado hit, uh, and as it hit, our piano swung in front of our kitchen window, and the glass all came in, and the piano stopped the glass from hitting us. Our house was picked up and sort of turned around. The roof went. Um, the front was the back, the back of the front. The roof went off. All I can remember is you could feel the wind in your house. Everything was moving and it happened so fast. It was like it was over in a second. A second is all it takes to bring tragedy to the neighborhood and create a miracle. Our neighbor was visiting another neighbor and she had her little baby with her and when the storm came she ran out and a telephone pole fell on her and she was killed but the baby wasn't because the baby, the baby was found underneath her. The raging windstorm moves through Windsor, heading for the Wowoko farm where Harry and son Joseph work outside. I think mom said that my brother recognized it as a tornado and told my dad they had to get into the house and go into the crawl space. So this is what they did. They were coming into the house and going to go down this trap door. Gladys urges her granddaughter Claudia into the crawl space and follows her down. Harry and Joseph are close behind. My niece told me the other day she remembered her grandpa had come in and he had blood on his face and he, she thought it was from the hail. When she went down under the house, she thought they put her down so hard that she went into the dirt and got dirt in her ears. But I think it was from the wind. A split second later, Gladys Wolico feels the house rocked off its foundation by the terrible power of the wind. She uh, just watched the house teeter back and forth. And she thought to herself, if it comes back this way, it will crush her and my niece. But as luck would have it, it teetered the other way. But luck is not completely with them. Harry and Joseph are nowhere in sight. Claudia watches as her grandmother's frantic cries are lost in the whirlwind. 
And she said she can remember Grandma calling for, remember calling Harry, Harry, he didn't answer. But she didn't know why at the time. She knew. She just didn't know why Grandpa wasn't answering. Monday, June 17th, 1946. In a matter of minutes, the worst tornado in Windsor, Ontario's history has cut a swath of destruction through the city and outlying areas, disappearing as quickly as it came. Everyone was coming out of their houses and uh, every, the kids were crying. There was a lot of yelling going on and I felt very, very cold. Uh, because the air became very cold. My sisters were screaming. We were all kind of clinging to my mother. And I could feel the um, a hail on my arms. I can remember my arms being uh, hit with ice. And I, I recall shaking and not being able to stop shaking. Virginia Herrick and her family have been remarkably lucky. Although the tornado hit the house dead on, no one has been injured, although the damage is incredible. The roof went off and it was like turned around. Uh, there were things that my dad had in the attic. There was a stove that he had moved up there and that was kind of hanging from the ceiling. In my grandmother's room, uh, the windows were all broken. Every piece of glass was broken except for the porcelain virgin that was sitting on her dresser. The family that came over to our house, th there was nothing left of their house. All that was left of their house was the floor. Even more incredible is the fact that many Windsor residents don't realize a tornado has passed through. I was making supper and all of a sudden I could hear my sister calling my name. And she came running into the apartment and she kept saying, Daddy died, Daddy died. When Helen arrives at her sister's home, she finds her family dazed with shock. Her niece, Claudia, is particularly traumatized. She just came running to me and grabbed onto me and didn't even want me to put her down. She was just hanging on for dear life and crying, you know, and I was just trying to calm her down and tell her everything was okay now. But everything is not okay. Helen learns that her father, Harry, tried to get down into the crawl space, but wasn't quick enough. He got caught as he was going under the steps. The, the house was shifting, and it sort of took a hold of him, and he was um, crushed between the, the uh, foundation and the house. Her brother, Joe, however, has survived unharmed. It is miraculous in light of the damage, not only to his parents' house, but also to the other homes nearby. Flattened right out, it was like an explosion or something that there was nothing standing up anymore or anything, it was just flattened right out. The house was off the, the base, and it was laying down uh, towards the, the driveway. So uh, I never did see uh, her father's body, where where he was, where he was trapped underneath the house. I um, I didn't feel like going there to to see him because it would upset her. It is a terrible night for many residents in the Windsor area, but the Jones family suffers the most overwhelming tragedy. Sadie Jones and three of her children are dead. Their battered bodies hurled a hundred meters from their farmhouse, their clothes torn completely away. The blackened body of Nelson Jones lies six meters from his wife's remains, barely alive. The father lived for about 30 days, but he died, and the mother and the three little ones were killed instantly. Incredibly, Carl Jones and his brother Kenny survive, but not without serious injuries. Carl had 
a two by four through his, his thigh and a broken collarbone. Kenny had a concussion. They, they kept Carl in as long as Kenny was there because to keep him company. In the end, members of the Jones family are among 17 area residents killed by the tornado, with hundreds more injured. What astounds many residents is how selective the tornado was. I couldn't understand how it could take two houses, leave the other three, not touch the car or the garage or a rickety old corn crib, and yet move a great big house. That's one of the defining characteristics and the damage associated with tornadoes is that you have a, a high gradient of damage where one structure is, is greatly damaged and then just uh, 100 meters away, uh, there's very little damage at all. And that's because of the, the intense concentration of energy in the tornado itself. In several cases, houses were lifted right off their foundations and thrown up to 100 meters. And a lot of the belongings inside the house, such as refrigerators, washers and dryers, in some cases, they disappeared completely. It is several days after the tornado that Virginia Herrick's father, Alexander, lands in Halifax and tries to find out the fate of his family. Naturally, I went to this sorty room where there, and there was a, an R.C. Padre and a Red Cross officer there. And he said, your wife is now living with relatives. I walked away. I'm halfway down and I remembered they didn't mention my kids. So I had to fight my way back up there. None of his children are listed among the dead, but Alex isn't satisfied until he gets home. But I got off the bus, and that youngest one, little Donna Marie, she saw me and she started to holler, but she didn't come to me. She ran like hell for home, <laughs> see, for the house, letting the other ones know that I was on the way. Well, that's where I felt better. I knew they were all right. Alexander is shocked, however, when he finally sees his shattered home. The next day, of course, when I went out and looked at the house, I thought I was back in Holland for a while, but, you know, but it didn't bother me because the kids were okay, see. Everything in the house was all over the place. This wall was that way, and of course this wall was this way. That's why it's impossible to try to build that back up ended up tearing it all down. A relief effort is set up to help residents rebuild. But the real effort is finding a way for victims to carry on. Uh, my mom, I think, was upset, pretty upset, because, uh, of course, we lost everything. You know, there was not, we had nothing left. So uh, she was pretty devastated. I think it, it brought us closer because uh, we, we needed each other more. All the responsibility fell on my brother. My dad was the breadwinner. Mother didn't work. So all the responsibility wound up on him. So it wasn't easy for him. I was my father's pet. I was the baby in the family. But I was so happy that, not at the time, but since then I've been lucky for the fact that he did at least seem to get married. For the surviving Jones children, it is especially difficult after suddenly losing both parents. And then they moved in with their aunt. The Tornado Relief Fund had uh, redone her house, her little cottage, into uh, two, two bedroom flats, but it still wasn't the same. In the decades since the Windsor Tornado, Technology has progressed so that weather analysts can now better predict tornado development, something not possible in 1946. Uh, one of the biggest tools we have right now is the weather radar, and in particular Doppler radar. So you can see where precipitation is falling and, and recognize that it's a potentially tornadic storm. Since that terrible day in June 1946, there have been many more tornadoes in Ontario, 
but only six with the same F4 classification as the Windsor Storm, with F5 being the most powerful. Although there has never been an F5 tornado in Canada, the one that hit Windsor on June 17th comes dangerously close, the third most violent twister in Canadian history. It is no wonder that even the passing years cannot erase the memory of those few terrible minutes. For many, it is a memory they will carry with them for the rest of their lives. Well, I think for a, a long time after that, my brother had a hard time with storms. He, um, I think he was nervous of them. Mom was, was uh, st she was strong, but I think she tended to when the storms were coming to pace more and you know watch out the windows more. Ruth was afraid of the storms. Uh, even a, a bad th thunderstorm she'd go down the basement and hide uh, since the tornado and up to the day she died she was like that. I, I had nightmares after. The nightmares were mostly the sounds the noises, the, the wind, and the rain. Thunderstorms after that were very frightening for me. I did not like thunderstorms. I don't like thunderstorms today, because I'm always watching the sky. Are you preparing for a real natural disaster? Or just want to have a really good camping trip? We've got a whole range of products that we think you're going to love, so come check them out in the store. Just by shopping for them, you help support Bad Day HQ and help us produce more great content.